So I want to just welcome all of you again for being here. Thank you for joining us and our regional centers are online. So welcome them, if you would, this morning with a round of applause. And so to start this morning, I'm going to ask Audie Diggs, who is one of our program representatives from our graduate and professional services, to come up and just open us in prayer. Let us pray. God, we are privileged to take part in community, Lord. We have the pleasure of coming together as a community, seeking to understand what it looks like to care for one another, God. To be present in you, to be present with each other in community, God. What a privilege it is to take part in that, God. Lord, might you lead us and guide us, might you direct us, might you influence us, might you stir up something in our hearts that leads us to care more efficiently for one another, God, but also leads us to self-care in a more efficient way, God. Continue to grant us the opportunity to, to fellowship in community, God, and ultimately to care for one another as we care for you, Lord. Be present, be in our midst, and let your Holy Spirit rest among us. It's in your name we pray. Thank God and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Audie. Uh, APU as a community has several uh, formal ways that APU can care for each of us in different points in our life and, and how we've exhibited that. We want to just take a few minutes to, to talk through that a little bit. Uh, Kim Levitt is our benefits manager, and she's uh, part of our HR department, but we want to just talk to Kim. There's a little bit, uh, there's a program we have in place for folks uh, here, for staff or families or acquaintances that are struggling a little bit. What is a way that APU cares for them through the benefits? Yes, I encourage you to do that. Look for the EAP or Employee Assistance Program brochure. Um, are you having some stress in your life? Is there a financial or a legal problem? Do you need to talk with a licensed therapist? Those are all things uh, that they can help you with. How about daycare uh, for uh, a spouse or that type of thing? There's all sorts of, of um, free access to information there and assistance there. So it's underutilized. Please do reach out and take uh, control of that because I think you'll be very surprised how you can benefit from the free benefit. Thank you, Kim. And uh, one of the things we've done as part of HR globally is we've reorganized our HR uh, department to provide a better point of contact for each of you as staff and, uh, and employees and faculty if you have any concerns that HR can help you with. And so we've restructured our department into a business partner model. And each one of you has a direct point of contact now. Uh, Rose Murillo is part of our business partner team. She supports uh, anybody who reports through uh, Don Davis, Kim Denu. Uh, Mark Dickerson or Annie as part of her support staff, her span of care. Also, we have uh, John Bogus is out here somewhere, right over here. John will support any of the folks, any of you here who report up through Mark Stanton. So that would include Vicki Bowden's group, Diane Guido's group, and Heather Petridis's group. And then uh, Steve Ramirez, right over here. Steve will be supporting anybody who reports up through uh, Bixby's area, which is DDH, uh, Terry Franson, uh, and David Peck. And so if you report up through those chains, they're kind of your go-to person to give you care, help, assist you in whatever needs you have to try and make it easier to navigate sometimes the HR labyrinth that gets tough to figure out what you're looking for and how to get what you need. So they'll be your kind of one stop uh, within HR as we try to reorganize to better care for each of you as APU uh, staff and faculty. Uh, and Rose, you also have another role that is sometimes things get a little tougher even than EAP or you want to help somebody. How can we provide care that way? Yeah, thank you. Um, as many of you know, there is or has been created what's called a care team for our undergraduate students if they're in a time of crisis. What we're doing is we're building a team or a care team for faculty and staff. If there are times of crisis for yourselves or for someone that you know of, you can let us know. You can let myself, John Bogus, Steve Ramirez know and we can help provide resources and support for those individuals. Great, and we don't just care for employees that are already here. Luke, you've introduced something with, uh, through HR Communication that kind of helps us care for even brand new employees. What have we been doing the last couple months? Yeah, so actually just at the start of this year, as you may have seen, 
already, HR has started a, a basically an email system to, to help us welcome our new employees. And so that's, the purpose for that is, is twofold. You know, we want to make sure our new, new employees, and we, you know, we hire hundreds every year, I want to make sure that they feel, feel welcomed and, and valued and supported at APU as they start a new job. And then also we want to make sure that, um, or help ensure that we as a community uh, can, can collectively know these new hires and know these new people and, and welcome them um, together. So we'll include some other things. You've probably seen some tips and some uh, news feed items, but really the purpose of that is to help us together as a community um, know and, and meet and, and welcome all of our new hires. So that'll come any week when we have new employees start. For most of the year, that's every other week you'll see that coming. Uh, and then for our busiest times, you'll see that um, even more frequently, probably every week. Great. It's just a great way if you see some name on there, you can welcome them to the community here. And new employees aren't the only ones that we want to care for. Shino, tell us what we're doing for some of uh, our moms in our midst. Great. So part of what I get to do currently is I'm serving as the Title IX coordinator for the entire university. And so more often than not, when people think about Title IX, they think of athletics or um, some of the sexual assault issues that might be happening or whatever it may be. But truly, um, part of what we get to do is also care for those moms um, who went and gave birth and is returning. And I think we do need to encourage women to return back to a community that cares for them. And so in partnership um, significantly with Rose um, from HR as well as facilities management and space committee, we were able to secure rooms, um, lactation rooms for moms. And so we have three now, yay. Woo. Um, and so, yes, it looks really comfortable, doesn't it? So. <laughs> Uh, we have three, one on east, one on west, and one in um, admin west as well. So our desire is to seek a space for all um, space, um, including regional centers. So we will be looking at that and trying to see how we could support. And so if you have staff or faculty and even students who may need that room, um, please contact HR and they'll be facilitating how to coordinate the usage of that room. So, Thank you, Shino, and thanks for all your work on that. Um, Next, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Kayla McGill, who is part of our staff council, and she's going to share with us some of the ways that uh, APU, through the Encouragement Fund, has helped several of us. And then we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Makeda Rose, who's going to share her gifts of music with us. She's a freshman student from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, so she's uh, enjoying the winter already here, 85-degree <laughs> winter day. That's not something she's used to. But before we do that, we've got a video that we want to show that really, it's a tearjerker, so that's the, uh, the warning if you are, you are prone to tears. This is a tearjerker video. Uh, but it just shows how a couple of employees cared about somebody and really lived out the one another's in a very tangible way uh, that they did just regular back of the, you know, kind of unknown behind the scenes uh, staff that really helped somebody out in a way that was pretty remarkable. So let's watch that video. There's really not a whole lot to do at Lakeside Park in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. At least, not in the winter. So why then, for the past couple months, have these two city workers been sneaking off, on their own, to shovel a walkway no one really needs to walk on? For most people, it's a path to nowhere. Yeah, it's a path to somewhere for one person. Jared Ebert and Kevin Schultz say they discovered that one person one snowy day. He was in his car. He was in his car and the snowbank was there. <laughs> Did you know what he was doing there? Kind, kind of put it together. It took us both back a little bit thinking, my gosh, his devotion is that strong that he still comes when he can't make it to the bench even. At the end of the walk, there's a bench dedicated to a woman named Betty Caldwell. And just based on the flowers, you can tell, she still loved. I'll give you a daisy a day, dear. I'll give you a daisy a day. Bud Caldwell says his wife loved that song, Daisy a Day. And the four winds we know blow away. So when he lost her a couple years ago, after 55 years of marriage, he got a bench in her memory and started taking her daisies every day he could. He thought no one was noticing. So imagine his surprise. Yeah, one day I pulled up there and there's the walk shoveled. What'd you think of that? My knees about buckled on him. <laughs> Bud couldn't believe someone would go to such trouble. Totally unexpected, you know. We're just doing what we felt was our job. I haven't read your job description, but I don't <laughs> think it's in there. 
some intuition, be it divine or otherwise, says, you know, this is why you're here, to help one another. Good afternoon, dear. Well, it's a nice day. Cold, but nice. Here's your daisy. Sometimes, to make a difference in the world, you need a good idea. And sometimes, all you need is to recognize the good around you and clear the way for it. See you tomorrow, Munchkin. Love you. Always did. Always will. I'll give you a daisy a day, dear. I'll give you a daisy a day. I'll love you until all the rivers run still. And the four winds we know blow away. Hello, everyone. Um, as Steve said, my name is Kayla McGill. And I had to watch that video about five times this weekend, so I wouldn't come up here just teary-eyed and crying. Um, but such a fantastic message about caring for each other. And so, um, as I said, um, Steve said, I'm part of staff council, and um, we're going to have some slides about uh, of pictures of all of your other, other staff council members as well. Um, it has their name, their department, and what campus they work on. And so, um, part of the way that we want to care for each other as a community is having a place to come to people and talk. Um, if you have a problem or a concern or a question, um, these are people for staff members that you can come to, if anything, and they will try to get you the right answers um, or a listening ear or anything like that. So these people are always here um, to help in that way as well. And so one thing that Staff Council does is we have the opportunity to be a part of the Encouragement Fund. And the Encouragement Fund is an amazing um, opportunity that um, was started quite a few years ago. Um, and it is a fund of money that is fully supported by faculty and staff here at APU. Um, and that money goes to other faculty and staff members who are in crisis and who are in need. Um, there have been quite a few um, ways that we have given out money from the Encouragement Fund. Um, people who have had their purse stolen um, from their desk and or people who are going, um, who have medical emergencies, um, people, uh, people who have uh, like lost things in a house fire. There are so many things that we want to be able to help people with. Um, if, if you are ever in any kind of um, financial difficulty, uh, reach out to staff council and um, into the encouragement fund and we will uh, be able to uh, go through the process of getting that filled out and so um, the way that you can reach out to staff council is you can either nominate yourself or you can nominate somebody else um, and you can do that through there's a form on the google um, a google like website and uh, we can send out an email with that but then you can always email encouragement at apu.edu and um, there is a team on the staff on staff council that reads those and it is fully anonymous and uh, well not fully anonymous there's one person who knows but not not all of staff council will know who you are or what, the amount of money you're getting or things like that and so we want it to be a place where people don't feel uncomfortable to ask for money if they are in need we want it to be a, a, a welcome um, environment for that and I just know that um, being a part of staff council and being a part of the encouragement fund I have had the great opportunity to see how APU cares for each other um, as staff members. And I just have a few quotes um, that I'd like to read about how people who have received from the Encouragement Fund, how it has impacted their lives and impacted how they work in the community here at APU. And so um, the first one says, the Encouragement Fund is such a unique and wonderful thing here at APU. When I was a brand new staff member, my supervisor emailed staff council about a rough situation I had gone through. Staff Council was so quick and loving in their response and was able to bless me with a very unexpected and kind gift to help me get through. It reaffirmed that this is a community that cares and one that I am proud to be a part of. Another person said, thank you so much for helping our family when my spouse lost her job. We were so grateful for the love and support of Staff Council and the Encouragement Fund. Um, and the last one says, I cannot begin to tell you how grateful I am for the gift from the encouragement fund that I received. I feel so blessed to work with people that exemplify what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. John 13.35 says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The people of APU have prayed my family through some very hard times and provided financially when the medical and pharmacy bills were overwhelming. The surprise gift from the Encouragement Fund came when I was very discouraged and struggling to keep going. Your gift was an outpouring of God's love to me and my family at just the right time. 
these people that um, have received the funds and the things that they were going through, um, they were able to reach out to something, not because of staff council, but because of your generous um, donations. The encouragement fund wouldn't be able to keep going if people of APU didn't care for each other. And so I know that we care for each other through prayer and um, through living life together. But one of the ways that we can also do that is through um, financially donating to the encouragement fund so that people like this can continue to reach out for help when they're struggling in times of need. And so today, I would like to ask you to just prayerfully consider how you might be able to give maybe financially to the encouragement fund. Um, we have these cards on your tables. And these are payroll deduction cards, um, and there's a few ways that you can um, you can fill them out. Um, there's some options on here. You can either make an every pay period donation, a once a month gift, a one time gift, or you can give a different gift not through payroll deduction. Um, and I would just ask for you to just think about that. Um, there's a little box over here that says, "Is this a new deduction, or is this an existing? Are you changing your existing one?" Um, and we. Uh, we on staff council know that uh, the people who reach out really um, are so grateful for the gifts that are given. And so I would just ask for you to just consider that. You can either fill that out and you can leave it on the table and we'll collect them afterwards. Or please take them back to your offices with you and you can um, put those just in university, the university mail system and they'll get to advancement. And I just want to, one, thank you so much for those who have been donating and been able to make these, uh, this impact on people's lives um, at our community. And so um, it's fantastic to be able to be part of a place where um, we care for each other more than just by, um, by word, but we care for each other indeed as well. And so um, right now I'd also just like to welcome up Makeda and she was gonna share her talents with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very thankful to be here today and to sing you a song. Today I will be singing Weep You No More by Roger Quilter. I'd actually like to dedicate this song to my mother, a woman who has given her entirety to my siblings and I. And I feel with this song that I would like to tell her to weep no more, to worry no more. I feel like we should do this in our everyday lives with everyone, with our siblings, with our spouses, with our friends, even with random people. We have to give back to them as Jesus has given to us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Makeda. And uh, just for your information, Makeda is going to be singing in APU Opera's production of Hansel and Gretel the last two weeks of February. Uh, and um, tickets are, you can buy tickets for that in the, in the uh, School of Music office. So uh, you want to hear more of that, you are more than welcome to uh, take advantage of that. Now, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be asking um, Jenny Reeve and uh, Peter Smart few questions, but uh, obviously, as you know, this is a celebration of our community. Um, we support, we minister to one another, we work together, and there are so many examples of that. One that I just want to tell you about that I think is pretty significant, um, um, because of some of the church identification and membership that many of you have, uh, it's important that you have a particular diet of fish tomorrow on Ash Wednesday and on Fridays throughout Lent. So a couple of weeks ago, I just emailed uh, Sam Simon and Jim Cacciatore and Roger Hodsden. I said, you know, um, is there a way that we can make provision for this? And literally within the day, uh, Jim stopped me on campus and said, Kevin, it's covered. Uh, we will make fish available for those in our community for whom that's important on Ash Wednesday, and we already make fish available every Friday of the year, and particularly through Lent. So it's just another way for us caring for one another, taking care of each other, as we live out the kingdom principles, as Steve has mentioned, and as you've seen on the slides. I often say that um, when you want to know what the principles of the kingdom are, go through the New Testament and circle the places where you find one another, because that's a kingdom principle. Uh, love one another, care for one another, bear one another's burdens, confess your sins to one another. That's a tough one, I know. Um, support one another. Um, greet one another with a holy kiss. I like that one. Be careful. <laughs> HR has something to say about that. Right? It's the one another's. And I'm really happy to introduce you to Jenny Reeve in advancement and her husband, John. And I've, I've asked Jenny if she would just share a little bit about the, the important ministry that your prayers have meant in her life through the community prayer requests and the answered prayers. sent out a prayer request um, with the nudging of my friend Rachel Lopez um, because our seven-year-old daughter was diagnosed with a pituitary adenoma, which is a small tumor um, in your pituitary gland of your brain. And I'm sure you can imagine that if your child is diagnosed with some sort of um, illness, especially a serious one, um, it's kind of earth-shattering. So I really felt that I needed as much prayer as possible. So instead of staying silent about it, um, I asked all my friends, all my family, anybody who I could think of, <clears throat> including my APU community, to pray for my daughter. And um, through a series of events and just miraculous interventions, um, we were told a couple weeks ago that uh, to go in for another MRI just to make sure that that's exactly what it was. Um, and we did, and we prayed. And we weren't just praying that God would give doctors the wisdom and how to treat it. Of course we were, but we were praying for the tumor to be gone because I believe in a miraculous God, and that's what I put in the email. And I just wanted to thank you all for praying because we got the report that she's the tumor is completely gone, and she's healed. And... Um, I've been working here for a little bit over a year. This is my first job um, coming back since having children. And I don't think it's an accident that God had me here and had me in a community like this when he knew that we were going to be facing one of the biggest faith challenges of our lives. So I know that he doesn't do anything um, on accident. And I just wanted to encourage you, you know, if you have prayer, uh, need anything, whether it be big or small, to reach out to people because I'm convinced that it's the collective prayer of everyone here and our friends and our family and our church that move the heart of God to heal our daughter. So. Thank you, Jenny. And 
you've described the answer to that prayer as well and sent that in so people can read about that in terms of watching how God answers prayer. Yes. Praise God. So those emails that you get, usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, community prayer requests, mean an awful lot. You have been praying for people like Jenny, and it means, and John, and uh, it means a great deal. And you can see on occasion the answers to those prayers. We've made those available uh, through uh, prayer requests at apu.edu and answered prayers. Same thing. And we can see the hand of God at work it doing these kinds of wonderful things. And sometimes it isn't as physical. But sometimes you need support for your immediate family and uh, some valleys that you're going through. That's what we're here to pray for one another, uh, because that's one of the one another's. Now, Peter, um, it's good to have you here, too. And I think that perhaps enough time has elapsed. It's never easy to say goodbye to a loved one. And uh, you've done that. But it's been enough time. Hopefully, you can tell us a little bit about that. And particularly, Peter, um, how this community and perhaps the people immediately around you uh, served an important role in your own journey of, of mourning? Well, we'll see about that if it's too early. Uh, uh, or if it's been long enough. Yeah, I understand. <clears throat> so I started at APU uh, four years ago, January of 2012. Um, and that spring, um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Um, my parents live up in Oregon, Portland, so um, it, was, it was a hard time because I couldn't go and see him through this, this time. Um, so there were a number of, of people, of situations um, uh, that were significant to me during that time. Uh, one of them was the encouragement fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the community provided resources for me to be able to travel up and, uh, and be with my dad. There's also a number of people that rallied around me um, to support me, that acknowledged this is hard, this is a difficult time, um, that asked me questions about how I was doing and what I was doing, and helped me learn to grieve in that process. Um, I think grief is not something that we're meant for. <laughs> it's not how we were created. So it's a, it's a human process that, that we had to learn, and I had people that came around me to help me learn that, that, that was significant. Um, I also had people that, I knew there were people who were praying for me. Um, uh, when dad finally passed, um, there were a number of people that supported me still, kept asking questions, even though it's hard. I mean, sometimes you don't know, want to, you don't know what, what do you say to someone that just lost a loved one? But people took time and showed me care by investing in me by asking me questions, by drawing close. And it was significant because through those experiences, I saw the love of Christ displayed in significant ways. Through that time, I saw God move unlike I'd, I'd seen him before. It was through that difficult time that, that the reality of God's love in my life was evident because of the community here at APU. So I, I was overwhelmed with the support, the love, and the care that was shown to me by people at APU, and I was so grateful uh, to be a part of this community. And now it's people like you who have learned a little bit about grieving uh, by the grace of God that also help others uh, who similarly may be walking through uh, a burden of loss, right? And I know you're ready and very available to walk with people like that and encourage them, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Jenny and John. Um, this is community. This is the principle of God's people in mutuality. And that means that we are vulnerable with one another to the point of letting one another know our needs. And we are open to each other in becoming the hands and feet of Christ in ministering to those burdens and needs. Now, I know that it's very easy for us to walk around campus and, and believe that everything is going really great. Um, I know there's a lot of burdens. I know there's a lot of brokenness and a lot of hurt in people's lives. And I don't mean to be a downer in this community gathering, 
but I know the reality of that, and you do as well. So I would encourage you, some of the things you've heard this morning, through the funds, through the people, through the services through that are available, I urge you to see this as the community of Christ supporting one another through the kingdom principle of mutuality. We are mutually submitted to one another as unto the Lord, and we bear one another's burdens. That's what Christian communities do. I'm going to pray. I know it's not on the schedule, but I'm going to pray, and uh, then our president is going to come and uh, speak to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ can be real in this place. We thank you for the story uh, that Jenny and John represent and the way in which you have used this community to touch their lives through prayer. I thank you for the way you have blessed Peter in his journey of release, sadness, and mourning, and you have used people in this community to be your hands and feet in ministering to him. So we place ourselves at your disposal to be your people, ministering to one another, that the kingdom of Christ may be real in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, so before I, I'm going to give you a bit of an update what's going, been going on and uh, appreciate you being here. But I want to just say, for me, some of the things that spoke to me today, I want to start with that lactation room. Uh, oh, come on. My beautiful bride uh, was actually, uh, in her role as a nurse, was a labor delivery nurse and a lactation consultant, but here's where I'm going with that. I know that there are a group of employees who meet and talk about how to make the nature of the university a more positive place for our women who are in employment. And, uh, and so I want to say, for every person in the room, including dads, we all ought to champion that. And I want to thank those uh, group, uh, that group of employees for coming forward. I think there are a number of recommendations they have. This is just the first. I, I, that's really remarkable. So thank you that we got that accomplished. Second thing that really struck me this morning in uh, listening to those who uh, had been a part of the community in some difficult time was Jenny's comment when she said, I am, you know, I got all my friends to pray. And then she said this including my APU community. So I was thinking, uh, so at the end of the day, you know, the 47-word mission statement of the university ends with these words that, that we encourage students to develop a Christian perspective of truth and life. This is what that means, that we want every student who comes to this university to leave going to the next place God has them having fully understood what the worldview of a Christ follower looks like. We recognize that not every student in, uh, who's enrolled here is uh, his cross line of faith, but, but when they leave, we want them to be able to have conversations about, have a deep understanding about what, what does a Christian worldview look like? Because we come from a uniquely Wesleyan holiness perspective, and one of the things I love about Wesley was he said, right belief and right doing kind of line up side by side. You, know, you can't have great theology if you don't live out your life in a way that matters. Uh, that Jenny would say, including my APU community, I would want every employee to feel that way. That, that as I go through my day, I see this community that I'm a part of, that I'm an active participant in, that I support in whatever way I can, and, and in return, they support me. And those students who see that in our life, that's really how we play that out. Those guys who were, who were uh, clean in the snow so that that uh, widower could put a daisy. You know, the heroes of that story were the guys who were sweeping the snow. And not just for the widower who gets put a daisy, but for everybody who sees their motive for living out their life around core values that matter. Does that make sense? So I just want to say thank you. I mean, I know it's Valentine's Day coming up, and uh, yeah, that's really wonderful. Uh, 
Uh, but that is a mark of how Christ followers are called to live, isn't it? That the expression of our love for each other comes from that deep and abiding place of our love for our Savior. Okay, let me give you some updates. Um, well, let me show you this picture first. We have these pictures on the uh, PowerPoint. This is a picture of me holding a mic, waiting for a picture to... Uh, <laughs> So, the day before I came back full-time, on Sunday, January the 10th, our, our remaining child, 28-year-old Kate, 28 because why would you wait till you're 28 to get married? I don't know, but uh, this is what, actually, she's perfect in every way, and she can wait as long as she wants, but this, uh, Gail and I get to walk Kate down the aisle, and the next picture, this is her new husband, Leaf. Uh, actually a graduate of Anderson University back in Anderson, Indiana, and a graduate student who a uh, graduate degree from Azusa Pacific University. And then the last picture, this is me, I'm a mess. This is the father-daughter dance. <laughs> and uh, I can't do it anymore. You know, I'm just done. I, uh, I'm weeping in front of the... Uh, okay, then the next day, uh, forget that. That's the only three pictures I brought. Um, <laughs> Come back to work uh, full time, and so I just want to tell you that I'm, I've said this, the leadership summit, and other, other a number of other places. I'm really grateful to be back at work, but I especially want to say, uh, Dave, would you stand? I want to thank Dave Bixby for leading in leadership. this was a Dodger game, he would have to come out of the dugout and <laughs> take a bow. But there are some things I want to bring you current on. Uh, the first is uh, that second week uh, when I was back, we had the board retreat uh, down in Carlsbad. And you may remember that our board, the men and women who serve on our board, serve without pay. Of course, it's a volunteer board. But more importantly, they really they, they show up with their resources and their wisdom. And I am so encouraged by the 30 people who are on our board and serve to advance our Christ-centered mission. This board was, uh, meeting was really strategic coming out of the September board meeting that I missed. Um, because the board is basically saying, look, uh, we really want to be strategic and forward-looking as we think about the dynamic changes uh, higher ed and Christian higher ed is facing. So a board committee, actually two committees were appointed and they met over the last number of months to come up with recommendations for how a day and a half, three times a year, can bring visionary and strategic leadership to the university. I, I love that they want to do their job better. So um, maybe, you know, many of us in this room serve on elder boards or deacon boards and so we're familiar with board meetings where you show up and you kind of review reports, right? <clears throat> and then somebody wakes you up when the reports are done. And um, so our board has said, look, we're not going to do that. You're going to send us all that stuff in between meetings. We will be current on that. But when we come together, we want to talk about strategy and forward-looking vision. I think that is really, really good um, for our board. It also mirrors what boards are doing nationally. Okay, so that's the first thing. Our board is asking for a gear shift from the administration, from the president, that as we structure that day and a half, that those committee meetings are absolutely strategic and primarily around our four doors of mission, academic excellence, valuing people, and financial excellence. The second thing our board did is they created a board blue ribbon task force. So this is a task force made up only of trustees, although this task force will engage widely members of the community and look at a number of documents of the university, this is their charge. Their charge is to ask the question, as a university, are we maintaining fidelity uh, to the university statements as found in this booklet, What We Believe? Uh, the, the board committee is being chaired by David Poole, who is the chair of the Board Committee on uh, Institutional Integrity. I'm really thrilled. I'm just gonna, trust me, there's gonna be a lot of heavy lifting with this. 
uh, but in many ways to have trustees revisit the core reason and the core purposes for what we believe in. What a great, what a great assignment. And so they're looking at, are, are we saying, are we, are we who we say we are? What is the fidelity to these very thoughtful uh, comments and statements about uh, our mission and purpose and statement of faith and identity statements and cornerstones and motto? What does all that look like for us? And so that's the update on the board uh, meeting. The next week, uh, I flew to Washington, D.C., uh, right after that historic storm blew through. My flight was actually delayed two days, uh, but uh, got there in time for the committees that I'm on and the work assignments I have with the CCCU. But I want to say this about that. It's a, it's a pretty remarkable gathering that the Christian colleges in America come together, that the presidents of those Christian colleges come together. But I want you to know that there's a Wesleyan holiness group, so a group of colleges and universities that come from the same faith tradition uh, that Azusa Pacific has. And I was asking Kevin this morning how many, and you said 68. There are 68 uh, of those Christian colleges and universities in America that, that come out of that same uh, Wesleyan holiness journey that we've been on. It, it gives me great comfort to sit with people like Dina Porterfield and David Wright and others who are presidents of those institutions and, and talk about what does it mean to have a, a Christ-centered mission in a world, uh, the culture and society uh, issues that we're facing today. It's a great uh, comment. I got out of there before another storm hit, and that was a, a good thing as well. I also want to, want to thank Dave. During my time, uh, he and a number of others recognized the need for us to think about how we uh, pursue that, that door of valuing people. And so the Valuing People Task Force was formed. A, a questionnaire went out. I want to thank all of you who responded to that. I have seen some of those results. So, so let me say this. Um, it's clear to me that, that from that survey that our employees are as missional as ever. They are saying, hey, look, uh, there's a reason I'm at APU. I, I received significant affirmation for being a part of this mission. But there's a gap between their feeling of being a, part of, a significant part of a mission and feeling valued. Okay, And so that gap is uh, being addressed in tangible ways by the, a group of people who are meeting to say, what do we do now going forward? Uh, Steve and Andrew are co-chairing that group. I think some good things will come out of that, but I just wanna say publicly, I, as I have read that, that was a resounding wake up for me. Uh, we've shared those results with the Institutional Integrity Committee of the board. The board will be looking over my shoulder going forward as we think about what it means to truly value our employees in ways that matter. Okay, so, so we're going to figure out what are the dashboards that would show how to move the dial, and then we're going to report out on a regular basis. And I want to thank those people who've been a part of that uh, process. I also want to thank those of you who were at the Leadership Summit a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, this, uh, we have decided as a nation and as a culture that February is uh, Black History Month. We do that because we understand one of, by the way, one of the core tenets of the kingdom of God that uh, created in the image of God is an inclusive statement, not an exclusive statement, right? And, and historically, communities of faith have not been good at that. Historically, communities of faith have made that kind of an exclusive statement. And uh, so I want to let you know, you know, for the 16 years I've served as president, God-honoring diversity has been a cornerstone of who we are. Long before I was president, it was a cornerstone of why this place existed. So I want to thank those who came uh, to the Leadership Summit. I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Sandra Richards-Mayo uh, and her presentation. I want to thank uh, Dr. Kim Deneu and how she is instructing both the board and the administration and our employees and how... Uh, we can strategically and missionally make our statements of faith an inclusive conversation. And what that means is that if somebody can agree to be a part of this community by the 
the standards and beliefs that we have, if they say, yeah, I can, I, I can sign up for that, I can check those boxes, then we want to make a place at the table for them, right? And, and for, for so long, faith communities have mostly focused on uh, replicating themselves. And we're gonna work really hard on, on Azusa Pacific University being a Christ-centered, God-honoring place that reflects the church of Southern California. And, uh, and that's pretty exciting, actually. The church of Southern California, diverse place. I want to talk a little bit about our academic uh, progress because a lot has been accomplished. Dr. Stanton, where are you? He's sitting in the dark. Would you stand in the dark? Because uh, what, a, what a symbolic. Would uh, you appreciate Dr. Stanton for his leadership? In <laughs> Actually, uh, one of the, yeah. <laughs> we should have given you a candle. Uh, oh, I guess there's a candle there. Uh, one of the symbols that is on the seal of many universities is that of a flame. The church understands that for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Higher ed institutions understand that as the power of truth in a darkened room. I want to thank Mark for his leadership in that area. I particularly am thankful for Mark and his team and their ability to add new programs that matter. You know, higher ed is really at a stuck place in many communities where families and students are saying, I don't know that it's worth it for me to get a degree that doesn't have some vocational or employability uh, future ahead of it. Um, Mark and his team have added a, as much as 25 new programs on campus in our regional centers. There are right now plans for 12 to 16 new programs, mostly taking programs to our regional centers, but in addition, some academic programs. So let me say this about that. Uh, this will be my 40th year as an employee of Azusa, Azusa Pacific University. If you add the four years that I was mostly a student before that, that's 44 years, if my math is right. Um, we have long been known as a place of innovation in our academic areas. We, are, we were often the first to the table with programs that connected students to uh, practical application. And I am encouraged that Mark and his team continue to say, look, we're not going to sit back and be included in that gray cloud of others. We will continue to distinguish ourselves with academic programs that matter. So please be in prayer for that. Uh, let me also just thank those of you who are helping uh, accomplish that on campus and at our regional centers. You may have heard over the weekend that Azusa Pacific University School of Nursing was identified as number nine in the, na I'm sorry, number eight in the nation. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to confuse this with number nine, because number nine was a cheesy place called, I think, Johns Hopkins. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I, that's, uh, you can pull that up. I think we sent that out as a campus-wide update. Uh, just late in the day yesterday, a national survey in the state of California recognized University College as the number nine online institution in the state of California, a state that has more online programs in any state in the nation. So that's a big yay God. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about God's provision. One of our doors is financial excellence. Since this fiscal year started, our advancement team under the leadership of Corbin has raised uh, right at six million dollars. Did, is it true you sold your hair to get the... <laughs> nah, you didn't say that. Was, uh, including seven gifts in excess of $100,000 and a significant gift of $1.37 million from the Wingate Foundation. Nearly exclusively, those gifts went to academic programs. As we gain traction and reputation for being a place of excellence, we'll need to fund that. And just let me say, Corbin, thank you for you and your team and all that you've accomplished. That's a huge yay God, and what have you done for us lately? No, <laughs> <laughs> no really, it's a hard thing. I mean, seriously, think of the big wins we have had in fundraising, and, and yet you come to work the next day and you're 
you're trying to climb the next hill. So when you want a word of encouragement, pass it on to Corbin and his team because uh, the men and women who work in that office do a great job for us. All right. Um, well, we're about done. Let's see if I've forgotten anything. I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Uh, uh, Andrew, where are you? Have I forgotten anything? Nothing you would add? Do you want to come up and say something? Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was in a church service a couple weeks ago, and Andrew was actually leading the congregation in appreciation for God's answer to prayer, much like we had here. And he told the story of, of working for his boss, me. He didn't you know, necessarily paint me in a great picture, but... Uh, <laughs> He accurately described me as a painful introvert trying to be accountable for having a lot of eyes on you when you go through things that are really hard. And uh, so here's the thing. Everything we say and do matters. There is no throwaway. And in God's economy, it mostly matters when we honor him and love him and when we honor others and love others. In God's economy, in God's economy, there are no throwaways. Would you please, in the job God has called you to, live that out in ways that honor the people you work with, the people who are in your span of care, and especially those students who will leave here with a Christian perspective of truth and life. Shalom.